Today's podcast is sponsored by my new favorite animated TV show, Tuttle Twins, the first cartoon series to teach kids principles of freedom, economics, and liberty, and to be funny in the process. Nowadays, hidden political agendas are constantly forced on your kids in entertainment and in schools. Tuttle Twins is a hilarious cartoon series that teaches kids about the principles of freedom without being overly preachy. It's educational and hilarious, and there are lots of jokes for adults too. The best part? You can watch Tuttle Twins entirely for free. Just go to TuttleTwins.tv, that is TuttleTwins, T-U-T-T-L-E, T-W-I-N-S dot TV, and over there you can watch all of the episodes for free. One more time, that's TuttleTwins.tv. Highly recommend it. Go check it out. What's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world? I would like to welcome you back to the Real Talk with Zuby podcast. On today's episode, we have got on a socio-political and cultural commentator, and this is the one and only Rob Smith. Welcome to the show. What's going on, man? Thanks for having me. It's been a long time in the making, long time in the making. Yeah, man. I feel like this episode is long overdue, and I'm sure we've got plenty of things we can talk about and which we're going to. But for people who aren't familiar with you, Rob, give them a little brief intro and tell them about you. Yeah, man. So, God, where do I even start? I'm a, I'm a rock war veteran. So the reason that people know me, the reason why I'm quote unquote famous, which is such a weird word, um, is because four years ago I came out as a black gay <laughs> Republican um, in about in 2018. So I came out via a, a uh, Daily Mail piece and then I started doing Fox News hits. Then I got involved with Turning Point USA and it's just kind of exploded uh, over the last couple of years. But, um, you know, here I am just fighting the good fight. You know, just God was on the campaign trail with Trump. And then the white, it's just, there's so many things that have happened in the past four years because of all of this exposure and because of me just saying who I am and what I believe that it's almost mm. like I can't even believe it uh, when I'm looking back at it all. That's awesome, man. Well, let's go. Let's go a little further back in the story. Yeah. Um, so, prior to these last few years, when you've been speaking about all these topics, tell me a little bit more about growing up. Where did you grow up, and what was your what was your life like leading up to this point? Yeah. So, I'm from uh, Akron, Ohio. You know, uh, grew up very lower middle class. One of the the things that my haters put out is, you know, I, I think that a lot of people when they see a, a, a black person that speaks a certain way or, or carries themselves a certain way. Um, they think that that person was born wealthy. They think that I went, was privately educated, something like that. That is nothing of the sort. Grew up very much um, lower middle class to a single mother. Dad was not in the picture. Um, and went through public school my whole life, like K through 12, you know? And I, I think that, it kind of informs who I am because I'm very much a bootstrapper. I'm very much somebody that believes that there's really the only limitations that we have, I think, in this world are the limitations that we put on ourselves. But to go a little bit further back, like I said, after high school was over and, you know, when you're born, you know, lower middle class, black kid in Ohio, not a whole lot of options in the world. I wasn't really put on a college pipeline. I didn't really know that that was something that was available to me. So I went into the military at 17 years old. I was so young. My mom had actually signed the waiver paperwork in order for me to get in. Mm -hmm. So I did five years in the military, right out of high school, deployed to Kuwait, deployed to Iraq. And I developed a love for America. I developed a, a different way of seeing this country or my country that I think that uh, a lot of, you know, the more prominent African-Americans in, in media have and deployed to Kuwait, deployed to Iraq, and served with all different kinds of people, you know, white, black, Latino, Asian, whatever. Mm -hmm. And the thing that bound us the most was that we were having this experience of serving our country, serving America. Mm -hmm. Got out of the military, used the GI Bill to do my undergrad, went to Syracuse University for undergrad, worked in media buying and media sales in New York City right out of college. And so this is where everything becomes relevant to this moment. I got involved in liberal politics. You know, I was mm -hmm. a gay guy. I got involved in the fight to end Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which was 
at that point in time, the law that said you could not be openly gay and serve in the military. I thought mm -hmm. that, that was completely ridiculous. I was closeted when I served, when I kind of figured out that I was a gay dude. And at any moment, I could have been fired for something I had no control over. I thought that was mm -hmm. deeply unfair. I decided to advocate against that. And we won. So we got Don't Ask, Don't Tell repealed. And, you know, we got uh, gay marriage and, and all of this stuff happened, which was great. And then all of a sudden, I started seeing this shift towards there is the, the radical gender ideology. And there was just this idea that you could not say this thing or that thing, or the fact that I was somebody that was advocating for liberal policies. It meant that I was supposed to feel a certain way about immigration, right? Mm -hmm. And so all of that stuff led me to sort of rail against that and to say, no, I, I, I do not think these ways about these issues and I will not be forced to think this way because of these identities or whatever that I carry because they don't define my entire existence. Mm -hmm. And that kind of brings us to uh, this moment where we're at right now. Yeah, that's really interesting. There's so, many, there's so many interesting directions we could go in from that, but given that you have just brought that up, I have a, there's an interesting thing that you just said there, and there's something that I've observed, and this is a theory I, I have, and let me know what you think about this, and perhaps you're, you're probably the best person to, to, to float this idea by. I noticed you talked about the gender ideology and some of the craziness that seems oh, yeah. to have been happening, especially since the early to mid 2010s. Mm -hmm. I have a theory that the gay marriage fight was the last legitimate liberal cause, shall we say, mm -hmm. in the modern West, not just in the US, but I think that was the last the last policy the last law mm -hmm. that someone could make a fair and reasonable case that that is discriminatory against a certain group of people and i noticed that there seems to be this line between that domino falling and the so-called left going crazy and starting to invent these new bizarre battles and ideas which now you yourself and many other people are opposed to. What, what do you think about that? Because I think if you think about all the previous decades, right? I think we're living in a very unique time and place because in all the previous decades, there was always genuinely a marginalized group of people in society, right? People mm -hmm. didn't have equal rights. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't need to go back that, that far. And, you know, black people, women, gay people, ethnic minorities of all sorts, all throughout U.S. history, all throughout British history, all throughout history of every country. Um, and now suddenly in countries like the USA, UK, Canada, Australia, you've got true equality under the law now. And I mm -hmm. think there's millions of people who haven't kind of realized that yet. And so they're, they still want to fight these battles. They've still got the civil rights energy. Yeah. But it's like those battles were fought. And, okay. won. and so what, what do you what do you think of that? All right, so let me break let me break it down. I don't know how okay. involved you are in the nonprofit world or, or anything like that. So not very. Um, it's okay. So in addition to so the, you know the new podcast can't cancel Rob Smith. You guys can find it everywhere. Um, I also started a nonprofit called the Douglas Society. Right, so it's about advocating for Black conservatism. Right, mm -hmm. so this line that you're talking about, this direct line between. Get, uh, marriage equality being passed in the radical gender ideology that we're seeing right now. This is about the nonprofit structure gone amok. So if you take the two largest, we'll say LGBT oriented nonprofits in this country, they are the Human Rights Campaign and GLAD, right? Mm -hmm. These two organizations have operating budget. I mean, they are sitting on, and when we are talking, HRC is sitting on hundreds of millions of dollars hundreds of millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. Glad is sitting on tens of millions of dollars. They could possibly hundreds of millions of dollars, right? So these nonprofits have become too big to fail in a sense. Mm -hmm. So there is a sense that as we were 
about to close the door on the marriage equality fight, which, by the way, people have been advocating for for the better part of of, of three or four decades, right? Since mm-hmm. since I think around the, the early 80s is, is when that started. So when that was accomplished, these people that had grown fat and happy getting salaries of hundreds of thousands of dollars and getting all of the celebrities to come back, all of that other stuff, they weren't just going to shut up shop. There was an organization mm-hmm. called MENY, Marriage Equality New York. They shut up, they, they shut down when marriage equality passed. Okay. But what happened is, and there's a direct line to what HRC has done over the past five to seven years. Now, marriage equality passed in 2015. Now, they barely ever say gay and lesbian. Gay and lesbian does not exist to them anymore. It is all LGBTQIA, et cetera, et cetera. They have Mm -hmm. decided that the radical trans stuff, the gender cult stuff, the identity stuff, all of this stuff... This is what gets them money. This is what gets them donations. This is what keeps that sort of victimhood nonprofit train churning. There are Mm -hmm. a lot of people that make a whole lot of money from these organizations that don't do a whole lot of work. And they would like to keep it that way. And the issue is, is that now, not only have these people basically become in in essence, Democrat party, Democrat super PACs at this Mm -hmm. point, because they are so aligned with the Democrat party. And so they're working kind of symbiotically to say LGBTQIA plus plus whatever equality is not achieved until we have um, equal rights for transgender. What does that look like? Because Mm -hmm. it looks to me that whatever equal rights, transgender people are allegedly fighting against always seem to come at the expense of the rights of biological women to their own spaces. Mm -hmm. And so that is what's going on right now. And and I'll tell you, I'm only one voice. There's There's a couple of other gays and lesbians that are bold enough to speak up against this, but you have to understand that you know you're speaking out against a machine that's got yes. hundreds of millions of dollars behind it not to mention the machine uh when it comes to transition and hormones and therapy and in surgery mm-hmm. and all of this other stuff that has got also billions behind it at this point yes it, it, it's a lot to take in and i think that a lot of people if you do not know how this world operates they don't understand why this mm-hmm. is all happening. But I'm telling you, Zubi, it's, it's all about money. And mm-hmm. money is why all of this stuff is happening. I think at the top level, I think that's that's certainly true. I think you have similar organizations in other countries. You know, Of course, I'm not an American. I'm from the UK. So right. I see things from a, a little different perspective. But I noticed that the same thing is happening. It's not, it's not a US-specific thing. It's like, wow, this is over the past, let's say seven to eight years this gender ideology as well as well as many of the other things people talk a lot now about critical race theory and this sort of new type of neo-racism and you know basically new ways to divide people even even further and to apply labels and put everyone in this category this oppressor group this victim group and so on um so oftentimes i think like what what was that point where 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 it just jumped the shark and there's something mm-hmm. you said there that's interesting as well which which i think about charities in general and it's interesting you said that there was that charity or nonprofit which closed down after it reached its goal mm-hmm. and i think that's what should happen i don't i don't think there should be all these uh charities and nonprofits and organizations which, which just run forever i think that in itself is a problem i think it should be okay here's the mission yeah. And then you can drive towards a certain mission and then people need to recognize the finish line. I think in the modern Western world, a big problem is that people don't want to ever recognize the finish line. Right. They don't yeah. want to say, oh, okay, like that. Cool. We, we accomplished this thing. <laughs> now yeah. let's, uh, you know, let's maintain it, but let's, uh, we don't need to keep fighting in this very, you know, in, in this way that we were previously. And when you realize that there's so many forces that want these people to continue to fighting. I remember I was in Fort Lauderdale with a Fort Lauderdale, Florida with a buddy maybe about a month ago. And we just walked and we saw one of the sort of LGBT oriented 
um, local newspapers. And it said, the fight continues. And I looked at my buddy, he's another gay dude. And I said, man, these people are going to be fighting forever. Mm -hmm. And what, it, what is it that they're fighting for? Yes. And that, that's where we are right now. Some people just cannot admit that they've won. I, I see, you know, I, I say the same thing with, you know, the black community. It's at a certain point, accept the progress that has happened and start mm -hmm. focusing on different things instead of trying to, like you brought up with the CRT stuff, instead of trying to sort of um, refit these ideas of oppression to the social media world to make mm -hmm. these people even crazier to make people feel even more hopeless to make mm -hmm. them feel even more victimized more oppressed so that our answer is to run to the leaders of the quote-unquote black community that nobody ever elected by mm -hmm. the way that nobody I've, ever I've said always... that these I... people are going to be our representatives I have to I have to jump in here and say as a as a foreigner, as yeah. a Brit, and I felt this throughout my childhood. I've always I remember even as a kid thinking this that it's ridiculous the concept that like Black Americans have leaders like un yes. like right right like 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 that this demographic of forty million people yes. has these sort of unelected representatives who come yeah. on TV and and say, oh, you know, so what does the black community think of this? Or what about and I'm like, wait, isn't this just one I remember literally being a kid of it, isn't this just one guy on TV? Like how he's how can he speak for how can he speak for all these people? Imagine someone coming on TV and saying, you know, oh, what's the so so tell us, so tell us, Jim, what's what's the what does the white community Exactly. Think about this. So, and I'm just like, dude, what a crazy question. <laughs> and we're and and we're like, black people are the only one. It's black people, and it's the you know that I call them the alphabet mafia. You know, it's black people in the alphabet mafia. We are the these are the only two groups that have these people sort of saying like, oh, this is what the black community thinks. This is what the other no other groups. Mm -hmm. So nobody's talking about you know what white people think or or what you know the Asian you know <laughs> <laughs> these. What we recognize, I, I think, inherently um, is that, you know, it's this idea, and, and this is where I fall. It is the idea of individualism versus collectivism. Mm -hmm. I, I think people like you and I, try, and you know, you engage with your haters a lot uh, on, on social media <laughs> as well. And you're always putting them on blast and you're always, I just think it's funny. Uh, because I honestly like I just I, I just I can't be bothered. I don't I don't engage yeah. in that way because I'm always like, you know, thinking about something else. But you really do. And so you have obviously and you smartly what I've enjoyed about watching you and following you is that you very smartly avoid uh, attaching yourself to, to sort of political parties. You know, you just it's real talk like you just keep it. I'm just going to tell you what it is. Mm -hmm. And moving into this next phase that I'm moving right now, too, I think that people are tired of talking about, well, the right does this and the left does this and Democrats are great and Republicans are evil. Yeah. And Republicans are great and Democrats are evil. Life is more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. But like I said, it's the individualist versus collectivist. I'm an individualist. I have given myself a license to be an individual person, regardless of what this world sees when they look at me or mm -hmm. what they think when they find out what my sexual orientation is, whatever. I know who Rob Smith is. And this mm -hmm. is an individual human being that is multitudes of different things. And I would wager to suspect that you feel the same way when you look in the mirror. How dare so you? why is it that there's so many people that look like us that have bought into this idea that we are all supposed to think the same way? It, mm -hmm. to me, is ridiculous. And I don't even expect everybody to be right-leaning like I am. I don't expect no, everybody no, no. to be... What I expect people to do and what I want them to do, what I ask my audience to do, is to just think. I don't want to tell you how to think. Mm -hmm. I want you to think. And if you come mm -hmm. with, up with a different conclusion, God bless. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's frustrating, but I can also... I can understand why it happens, you know, both on a, on a large scale and a, on a small scale. And I think the truth is it's, it's hard 
to be, you know, human beings are, we're simultaneously individualist and collectivist, mm -hmm. right? We all have some degree of tribal mentality. Mm -hmm. Some people are far more tribal than others. And the way that those tribes are delineated can very much change. You know, it can be based on so-called race. It can be based on ethnicity, nationality, gender, sexuality, sports team. It can be based on, there's so many ways, religion, there's so many ways you can, you can classify and cut up groups of, of humanity. Yeah. And we all like having some tribe that we can belong to, 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 to some degree, right? Most people like that. And I think what's really challenging, especially in the line of what you do or what I do when you are doing some type of social commentary is if you are truly an independent thinker and you're not explicitly hardline down the way one way or the other, not, not just, you know, a lean or, you know, kind of free floating, like you, you get, you get flack from both sides. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think most people would rather deal with flack. I think people are quite dealing with flack from the other team, yeah. but they don't want, they don't want any friendly fire. Right. They don't want to be that person who, you know, oh my gosh, you're getting, you're getting crap from this side of people. And then you say this one thing and now you're getting crap from this other side of people. And, well, you know, <laughs> I, I start actually, you know, as of late, I've kind of started embracing that. Right. Mm. Because I've never, look, I, I, I said that, you know, I, I am likely to vote Republican, right? I'm just a, a, sure. a center right leaning dude, mm -hmm. but I get a lot of crap from people on the right because, oh, well, you're not true conservative because you're gay and we mm -hmm. think about whatever and blah, blah, blah. So I get that crap from them and I get the same stuff from the left, right? So for me, it's about what is being honest? What is yeah. being real? And there is nobody, there are very few people and I, and I really do feel like we're moving into this phase where people are tired of all of it. And, and again, going back to how you manage your voice, it's very smart because people are tired of all of it. And there's even me with, with kind of what I do. And so, you know, I'll be at, you know, Mar-a-Lago and I'll be around, the, you know, the Trump crowd and I'll be around famous yeah. conservatives and all that stuff. And I'll do that. And it's fun. Yeah. You know, it is what it is. But at a certain point, you know, you, you have to speak truth. I remember when January 6th happened uh, and I did my, my previous podcast and I did a podcast and I basically said, why were you people in the, why were you doing this stuff? This was a honey trap. Like this was stupid. Mm -hmm. I saw this coming eight miles away. I was invited to be in D.C. at that rally. I said, are you out of your mind? I don't want to be anywhere near D.C. that day because mm -hmm. there's not a bad feeling. So I said this and, you know, lose tens of thousands of followers. Yep. Right. Yeah. And for me, it was worth it because yeah. I don't want anybody. I don't want to attract an audience that wants to be in an echo chamber. Mm hmm. If, mm -hmm. And I tell people that that listen to me or follow me, and I'm on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram at Rob Smith Online. And I tell people, look, if you want a conservative echo chamber, if you want to listen to somebody that is just going to say all of the things that you already think and wants to affirm everything, there are plenty of options. Yes, there are plenty of options that will never challenge you. Do mm -hmm. not come here for that. And I think you know, that when you take that, I think that when you take that risk, it pays off. I, I agree with you totally. Um, but I think people, <laughs> it's like, it's like, it's the same with free speech, right? People like free speech. People like free thinking until it disagrees with them. <laughs> exactly. And this is not, uh, yeah, sure. I think, I think this is something that's more associated with good reason with the modern left, Yeah. but it's not something that is unique to them. It is, it is just a human thing. Every single person likes to have their beliefs and their biases confirmed. This Absolutely. is just a reality, right? It's not something I, I pretend that I'm some exclusion to. I think the, a big difference is that, number one, I acknowledge it. So I don't yeah. even pretend like, oh, I, I'm, I'm perfectly objective and I have no biases. It's like, no, look, I have my beliefs. I have some my biases. I, I have the same, uh, you know, mental workings as, as most human beings, right? We're not these perfectly rational and logical and unbiased creatures. So I recognize right. that. And also 
I try to manage and temper it to a reasonable degree. Mm -hmm. I try not to fall victim to audience capture, which is what you're referring to. So losing tens of thousands of followers for someone who makes their living on social media and who's a commentator, yeah. Yeah. that that that's not pleasant when it's happening. No, right? no, it wasn't. Like it, it's it, right? it's not nice to see your not. Oh, geez, like like <laughs> seeing your your numbers just dropping and people like piecing out and saying, yeah, "Oh, you know, what? It. it's not you know, it's not pleasant." No, it's a, and, and you get a lot of those. Well, you know, you're not really this, or you're not really mm -hmm. that, or I can't believe you, or blah I'm blah. Disappointed blah. in you? Yeah. Oh, I'm so I'm, I'm so disappointed, disappointed yeah. in, in you. I used to um, like you. I love you. I love you. I love you. But I love you. Yeah. But. You and know, then just the announcing that they're going to unpopular, just go. Yeah. It's actually fine. Yeah. Uh, run back to the echo chamber. And no, it's not pleasant. But what I really see it is at this point, you know, moving into this new phase, launching you know, Can't Cancel Rob Smith and doing some other stuff that I'm doing. It's just it's necessary mm -hmm. because it's necessary for growth. It's necessary for my growth. It's necessary for attracting the audience that I want. And, and this is what I think. I think that if you are honest with people, I think that if you do not lie to them and do not try to manipulate them, I think that people will take the journey with you, even mm -hmm. though they may not agree with everything you say. I, I think that sometimes as a Black conservative, you know, there's an audience that loves you when you're railing against BLM or when you're, you know, railing against whatever. Mm -hmm. And then there's an audience that can't stand you when you say something like, oh, yeah, you know, racism is a very real thing in this world. I've been a black man for over 30 years. I see it every single day and in, in, in some ways that are subtle and some ways that are bigger. This mm -hmm. is to me, this is like saying the sky is blue. Yes. And, and, and so I don't let it get in my way. I power through it and I'm, you know, I'm going to get to where I need to be, but I'm not going to sit here and deny its existence. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I think uh, something I notice here is, you know, a couple of things. I think number one is simply the, the pursuit of truth and honesty, mm -hmm. right? Being actually not just caring about scoring points and, you know, scoring points for your team, but actually trying to get to the truth. And I think that so many people are now just so obsessed with scoring points for the team and for the tribe that the truth, screw the truth, right? Yeah. Whatever. Who's got the quickest hot take on any issue. Something just happens. Boom. Like you Twitter lights up. Mm -hmm. and, oh, hey, this is the accepted left wing take. This is the accepted right wing take. Do not That's deviate so from the script. That's just it. And there's just this dopamine hit. And then people start, you know, joining in and and I think it's it's very hard to resist that because it takes long-term thinking. You know, mm -hmm. it takes long-term thinking. Because the truth is, in the short term, I don't think it's particularly hard. I think if you're quite charismatic, I don't think in this day and age it's particularly hard to be a political firebrand on either side. Of yes. That, right? I think if you're quite charismatic, you can just, you know, repeat the talk, repeat the lines, attack, attack, attack the other side mm -hmm. all day every day, make fun of them, call them names. You know, we, we, we all know how it goes. If they're on the right, if they're on the right, you call them a racist, a white nationalist, white supremacist, transphobe, homophobe, so on. If they're on the left, you call them a, a libtard, um, you know, woke idiot, like whatever the, you know, re regress, like whatever the terms are, you just repeat it. Oh, oh, there's a new label. Okay. Now it's anti-vaxxers. Call them anti-vaxxers now. Oh, now it's pro Putin. Call them pro Putin. Right. And it's, it's very lazy. And I think in the short term, it works well, but I think that it doesn't really last because no, it doesn't. the world shifts and changes and what people espouse and believe. It's, it's why I even, um, you know, I, I think I'm not a huge fan of people labeling themselves unnecessarily, mm -hmm. but I think even if you are going to label yourself politically, it's always made more sense for someone to say, I'm a liberal or I'm a conservative or I'm a libertarian mm -hmm. or I'm center left leaning or center right really leaning or whatever than to say I'm a Democrat yeah. or I'm a Republican because the parties change. So someone who was a Democrat in 2007, right, 
Yeah. Do, are, are you necessarily st- like the party is not the same now and as it was in 2007. I can see that as an outsider. They, they're like, this is yeah. not the same. This is not the same party in any and way. Neither of them are actually. No, they, no, they've both changed. And look at it. And it's so funny as you bring that up because I sometimes think back and I'm, and I'm, you know, I'm old enough to remember when liberals and the left hated corporations. Yes. And when they hated this sort of overreach and all, and, and, and now that they can control these people and they can be used to sort of push their agenda, now they love it, right? Mm-hmm. And even, you know, the Republican Party, this is not the same party as it was even in, in 2007. And I think that, I mean, Jesus, even Barack Obama, and you notice how gingerly he manages his public persona nowadays because mm-hmm. he is deathly afraid of his legacy being called into question and people calling him, you know, not uh, open enough to illegal immigrants or not, you know, accepting enough to gender, like all mm-hmm. of this other stuff. Gay marriage and, itself. In gay marriage itself. Yeah, he evolved, mm-hmm. right? It's, it's very interesting how Obama is able to evolve. But uh, when a Republican no is against gay marriage, <laughs> nobody can. They're just no. brand new forever. So it's just these double standards. And these parties are changing and these things are shifting. And and what I was about to say is what's crazy to me as a media guy and have worked in pretty traditional media for a very long time, you know, did CNN and and, and NBC News and Yahoo News and, you know, have a degree from Columbia and journalism and all that other stuff. So I had a very traditional career until I decided to go the social media route. And when you watch MSNBC and you see... Somebody like Nicole Wallace, this was somebody that was one of the architects of the Iraq war. Mm -hmm. This was somebody that was pro everything that the left apparently hated. And so now she's some sort of liberal hero. Things are switching. And I think that they're they're happening very slowly Mm -hmm. to where liberals are on the side of authoritarianism and on the side of mm-hmm. oppressing speech and on the side of big corporations and all that stuff. And Republicans are on the side of free speech and the working class and nationalism and all these things. It's really crazy to experience. I mean, it, it really does blow my mind sometimes. It, it's super interesting. And it's it's interesting and I think important for people to note that this phenomenon is not unique to the USA. Hmm. The exact same thing is happening in the UK where you've now got, you know, in the last general election, I mean, so in the UK, the main parties are conservative and labor, yeah. right? And labor is supposed to be the party of the working class, right? Historically, traditionally, that's what it's supposed to be. The blue collar workers, the people up in the, you know, the, the Northeast, less university degrees and so on, you know, the, the party of the common man. And over time, it's become this increasingly London and Southeast England based affluent, elitist kind of snobby, Mm -hmm. turn your nose down, champagne socialist, limousine, liberal type of party. And the conservative party, which isn't really all that conservative by, by American standards, but they've been gaining in all these areas that it would have been unheard of for them to vote conservative in the past. And so the, the this same switch is happening where the people who are trying to, you know, look at the past two years, the people who are trying to force the mandates, people trying to force the restrictions and so on and so forth. Yes, it, it wasn't as partisan in the UK as it was in the US, but so many people who, who would call themselves liberal, who are advocating for the most illiberal policies, who are advocating to segregate society based on medical status who want to have this papers please situation where you can't do anything unless you you know you show your id and you show your papers and this and that and it's this strange inversion you're seeing right now there's a lot of talk about free speech and censorship um i actually think one of the dumbest mistakes the so-called left has made over the past decade is giving the concept of free speech to making it a right-wing concept Mm-hmm. Right. I think that is one of the dumbest things that they have done. Right. Like it shouldn't I don't think it should be a a partisan issue in itself. Yeah. But if it were to be, you know, it would 
free speech you associate with the word liberal, with 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 liberalism. I I grew up in the Middle East. I grew up in Saudi Arabia, right? <laughs> so that's a very conservative country in many ways. Um, there are things you you cannot say. There are things you 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 don't just have this freedom of expression and freedom of religion and whatever. And so it's so strange to me as someone who grew up the way I did and where I did to kind of be looking at these countries that are supposed to be the bastions of liberalism. I mean, look at Australia, look at New Zealand, look at Canada yeah. over yeah. the past couple of years. I'm just like, how is this liberal? I'm like, this, there's nothing liberal about this at all. This is super authoritarian. And so this is what's happened. It, it is, and you know, I have a, um, you know, somebody that used to be a friend that was in Australia during this, this whole time. Mm -hmm. And so what has happened is this, Zuby. These people have realized that if you can appeal to somebody's sense of being a good person, yes. their sense that of humanity, their sense that they're an elevated, if you can appeal to that sense of people, you can get them to advocate for the most inhumane things mm. we have ever seen. If, if you know, you can advocate for, for forcing people to get a vaccine that they do not want to get. Mm -hmm. um, you can advocate for people being fired for saying the wrong gender or saying the wrong thing or voting for the wrong candidate or doing whatever. Mm -hmm. And so that is what has happened. And a lot of people have been very manipulated because I, look, I lived in the land of the limousine liberal for a decade. Moving back there, New York City is what I'm talking about. And these people... I, and I'm talking liberals, not leftists. I yes. do believe that they want to feel as if they have others' best interests at heart. Mm -hmm. And I think that 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 sort of sense of humanity that they want to portray has been manipulated by some very evil people that mm -hmm. have some very nefarious intentions for our society. Man, I agree with you so strongly on that because I think one of the one of the darkest things that's happened, especially over the past couple of years, is I think that people's people's sense of, let's say, as you as you described, love for humanity or compassion. I, I often use the word hijacked. It's been it's been hijacked. Mm -hmm. Right. So people's better natures have been hijacked through this whole safety and security and you protect me, I protect you. And the way some of the slogans and the behaviors, it's all been done to appeal to people's better nature. Right. It's mm -hmm. not being done in a in a sort of directly evil and dark way. It's like, oh, actually, you're a compassionate person. But you know what? If someone is very compassionate, you can you can hijack that right, with the Absolutely. right type of propaganda, right? And Absolutely. you can make them a machine. You can make them a cog in a machine that is now doing evil, that is now oppressing other people, that's now advocating for discrimination and segregation and restrictions and the trampling of human rights, all under this notion that by you doing this, you are a good person. And I think that's one of the most twisted parts of it all. And also, not only can you advocate for all of that stuff, and this is the thing that really, really did strike me, you know, going, like I said, I've been, I've been at this for about four years, and you can tell people that their interpersonal relationships with people that they have known for years, if not decades, that these things do not matter because now if they do not think in the right way, they are now evil. Mm -hmm. And you must not be associated with them at all. Yes. And that is the, the craziest thing. Since I have become more vocal about this, I've lost, uh, I had a, a best friend of well over 15 years. I, this person, I had the wrong opinions about BLM, right? Which have sure. obviously been proven right two years later. But, you know, people don't see these things at the mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. I had long opinions about that. So that person's gone. Fraternity brothers from college, you know, disinvited to weddings. That's a, that, that, that stuff's gone. People that I've known from college, that stuff is gone. And these people feel like they're the good guys because mm -hmm. they have pledged allegiance to these movements that will do nothing but use and discard them when mm -hmm. the time is right. And they don't see this.
So you are pushing out people that you actually know and respect and love in your personal life yes. in the service of the state or in the service of BLM or in the service mm -hmm. of Dr. Fauci or in the service of public health or all of this other thing. It's a very, very dangerous path for the world to have been going down for the past couple of years. I think that we're moving out of that world. I think that people are starting to wake up to the ways in which they have been used and manipulated. Mm -hmm. Every sign that we're getting is telling me that people are over it, that, that we're moving on to some sort of what I like to call the post-woke era. Whatever it is that this country is going to be after the madness and insanity of the last decade is mm -hmm. what we're moving into. I agree with you. I think we're at the early stage of the pendulum swinging back. We've been yeah. living in this age of overcorrection. Um, and I think it's also important to ensure that we do not overcorrect too hard mm -hmm. in the other direction, right? Mm -hmm. This is something I, when, when I look at history and when I look around at the, the world, one thing that always strikes me is that human beings really struggle with balance. Yeah. Like people really struggle with balance. It's like, Okay, you look over there, it's like it's too far this way, and then oh, it's too far that way. And it's like, man, can't can't there just be this like middle, this <laughs> this happy middle where you know things oscillate a little bit, but it's yeah. not these wild swings from one pole to the to the other pole. So I hope that's something that um, you know, I am I am hopeful and optimistic about that. And I think we need more optimism because I think a lot of people are, you know, sometimes with good reason, but I think there's a lot of people stuck in Doom, doomsday mentality right now mm -hmm. on uh, on both sides of the aisle. Everything is an existential threat and the end of America and the end of the world. And I don't think it's um, I, I don't think that's an inevitability. I, I think it's also important for people to remember because so many see, here's here's something funny. So many Americans don't understand why non-Americans are so interested in what happens yeah. in the U.S. And it's because as they say, when, when the USA sneezes, the world catches a cold. Yeah. And the USA, for better or for worse, is a very powerful and in influential country. What happens in the US affects what happens in Europe. It affects Absolutely. what happens in, in Canada. It affects what happens all around the world. And many of the ideas that, you know, sometimes there's a, a kooky idea which kind of comes from the US, like many of them do critical race theory, whatever it is. And then what happens a couple of years later, ooh, all of a sudden you're watching British TV or you're talking to a, you know, a university student in England and all of a sudden they start bringing up some of these ideas and concepts. Yeah. Um, even what, applying what the framework when it doesn't make sense because the USA and UK have a very different racial history, let's say. Absolutely. So, I mean, look what happened with BLM. And I remember was, there was BLM Canada and BLM UK and all this. Other yes. stuff. I was like, well, wait a minute. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like, what is America's history of slavery and, and legacy of racism? All that? What does that have to do with the UK? It's a completely different thing. What does that yeah. have to do with Canada? This is a completely different thing. So it's just like outsourcing, you know, this this victimhood. But but a lot mm. of this stuff, you know, as much as they call people like you and I grifters, that's the famous, like, oh, you're grifting. You know, this is, you know, this, this victimhood thing is, is a grift that can be exported out to different countries. Mm -hmm. So, and it, and it's, and it's also embarrassing because I'm like, dude, look at the time we live in. Yeah. Right. I mean, and for anyone who's traveled the world, I mean, you, you've been to the Middle East, you've seen other parts of the world. Oh, know, yeah, yeah. My family background's originally, you know, from Nigeria, you know, you, you see, and you experience how you know, if you see, just see, you don't even need to experience, you just see how billions of people, even in this prosperous time, live around the world. And it's like, man, if you are in the UK or the USA, in the Western world in general, in 2022, and you are even able to listen to this podcast, like you even right. got the technology to be live streaming in this in HD on your phone. It's like, bro, you are privileged. People like to yes. throw around this term, you know, privileged and oppression. It's like, dude, we are all privileged yes. like we're we, we're all and that's not a bad thing that's a great thing so many people have sacrificed and fought all of these battles blood sweat tears and years for us to be able 
to do what we're doing for us to have this freedom to have this liberty so i'm just like yo guys let's not let's not ruin it this is a this is a unique and special situation that we've got and i think so many people don't appreciate it because they don't recognize that they just think like oh freedom and liberty and equality and non discrimination these are easy things to come by it's like no it's not man this is a rare and unique period so let's not go backwards let's not go backwards and you have to understand you know never discount the forces that need people to be angry Mm -hmm. there are a lot of people in this world and again and i think that this goes beyond political parties or left right or whatever there's a lot of people that gain power the more powerless the more angry the more oppressed uh the more victimized certain people feel and i think that that is a huge part of a, a lot of this stuff I, you know, I used to have a, a friend, my, you know, my, my ex best friend that just said, I can't talk to you anymore because of the owners, whatever. And he was just so, so on the left. And this person went to a liberal arts college, was, all, you know, always had iPhone, whatever, like always all of this stuff. And I would tell him and I would say, there's so many different ways that you can make money out here in the world. There's so many different ways that you can do it. And it's like he would just battle me and tell me why he couldn't, why he couldn't, why he couldn't. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you just get tired of having that conversation. I remember being in Minneapolis two years ago in the wake of the George Floyd protests. I ended up raising $150,000 to go to the business district that kind of got burned down. And I just remember I was talking to this uh, this young black guy at the the Floyd Memorial. He didn't know who I was, anything like that. We just got to talking and we got to having this debate about America and all that stuff. And I talked to this young man for 30 minutes. And every time that I told him he could do something, he would counter it with, well, racism this, or I can't do this, or I don't know this, or I don't know that. And I just do not know how you can battle that mindset yeah i think it's addictive for a couple of reasons um i think the first one and you've sort of already alluded to is that it's got some type of social currency and value these days yeah there's some there's some level of clout in being a victim and claiming oppression which is weird and backwards to me but there's some there's some cachet in it um and whatever group you're in in any way you can sort of claim some type of oppression that's seen as a as a good thing but i think more importantly i think the crux of it and i don't think people admit this but i think the biggest reason why it appeals to people is because it acts as a permanent alibi mm -hmm. right with yourself and myself we take responsibility and accountability for our actions words successes failures our behavior right yeah. if you yeah. If you launch your podcast and you know you, you succeed, you succeed, and you can take you can take credit for that. You're like, man, look at what I built. Look at the thing I've created. There's things yeah. you've done, and you're proud of them, and you can stand on them. There's also things you've done, and you're like, ah, eh, you know what? I could have done that better. Or you know what? I did that thing. It wasn't very successful. I put out that video. You know, it kind of flopped. Like, cool. You can you can you can take all that. But I think the the victimology appeals to people because no matter what, you always have an excuse. You always have an alibi. Mm -hmm. If you believe that the the white supremacy is out to get you or the systemic racism is out to get you or the patriarchy is out to get you or the heteronormativity is out to get you, whatever it is, you always have an excuse yes. to not put in maximum effort. And if something goes wrong, you could just go, ah, well, you know what? I tried to do this thing, but you know what, bro? Like, you know how it is, man, white man's world, you know, structural racism, you know, the, 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 uh, the, white, yeah. the white man didn't want me to didn't want me to do it. Or you know what? Uh, you know what, girl, the patriarch, you know, the patriarchy, the mm -hmm. patriarchy crushed my business, the patriarch me, you know, and it's, I think that's why it appeals to people. And I don't think people would be honest about that, but I think that's why people cling to it. And I think it's also why they get angry when you tell them, Hey man, you're not oppressed. You are not a victim. You, you have the ability, like that's an empowering message, but for some people it freaks them out because you're pulling away that safety raft their their excuse for failure look <laughs> i have failed in so many different ways i would say over the past god i don't know five seven ten years in taking responsibility for one's own failures 
that's a tough pill to swallow when you're looking back and you're saying, I bungled this opportunity, I bungled that opportunity. You know, even right now, you're a big fitness dude. As of right now, you know, I put on 20 pounds during the the pandemic or whatever, right? Because everything's shut down, you know, we're in an apartment eating, drinking, gyms are shut down, whatever. Mm-hmm. And now I'm, I'm finally getting to the point where, you know, I've yo-yoed for the past two years, but I'm finally like, okay, I'm actually going in the right direction and I'm getting stronger and I'm also losing weight, whatever. You have to take control of the fact that it wasn't Joe Biden wasn't pouring a bottle of Prosecco <laughs> down my throat every night. You know what I mean? Like Kamala Harris yeah. wasn't feeding me tortilla chips. You know? <laughs> like, I made the decisions to do those things. Like I did that to myself. Yeah. And it's up to me to lose that weight. It, it, mm-hmm. it, even outside of all that stuff, it's, you know, four years ago, like right before I started doing this, I had went about my media career in a very traditional way until I realized that the traditional ways were not working. It was you go produce for an organization and, you know, you make your fifty, sixty thousand $60,000 a year and you are hot crap because you work at ABC or Yahoo News or CNN or NBC, whatever. And this gives me cachet. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, you know, I got laid off via email the week before Thanksgiving. Oh, wow. And I said, you know what? These people do not care about me. Mm-hmm. They, these people do not care whether I live or die. It is up to me to figure something out and to make this happen. Mm-hmm. And that was the moment that I really became an entrepreneur, that I really said, I'm in control of this. And I got to build this stuff out for myself. And look, you do the same things. You've got books and, and merch and your music and your thing and all of that other stuff. You build that yourself. Yeah. And even going into the social media thing, and, and you know, forgive me if I'm ranting, but I feel very strongly about this. If you've got an iPhone, you've got the most powerful computer that has really ever existed in your hand. You've got social media. And if you can't figure out a way to make this work, and it doesn't have to be political commentary, it doesn't have to be the stuff that you and I do. Mm-hmm. You can't figure out how to make this work. There's a guy that I that came up on my Twitter feed. He's like, I make $2 million a year selling hankies on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. It's the People are selling crazy- yeah, it's a crazy dude, thing. Dude, I, I, I saw one where someone someone was selling, they were selling air. They were selling air. I don't know if it was from the Himalayas or like, they were traveling to different places and like sell, like capturing the air in a bottle and just like, just selling empty bottles of air from different places. So you could get, I don't know, air from the Grand Canyon, air from the Himalayas, air from, you don't, like, dude, if people think there's no business opportunities, go to the, go to the supermarket and go to yeah. the bottled, go to the bottled water aisle and look at the look at the range of bottled water, <laughs> and there are still coming. There's still people coming out with new brands of bottled water. Like, so many, how can you make I, a new brand? <laughs> I have this. So this is this thing that I drink right now. Okay, so this is called Hint, right? Okay. And it's like it's water infused with watermelon essence. This is like three dollars a bottle. <laughs> it's, 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 it's crazy. It's ridiculous. There's opportunity ridiculous. out there, man. There's opportunity out there. You're yeah. Rob, man. It's been it's been such an honor to talk to you. I know you've got your uh, you've got your new podcast, which is starting. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, man. It is called Can't Cancel Rob Smith. So anybody, you know, anybody out there that follows Zuby, likes what he has to say. If you like what I have to say, um, go to Apple Podcasts, iHeart, Spotify, wherever you find your podcast. Download Can't Cancel Rob Smith. You know, this is just basically my take on politics, my take on culture, my take on life. It's not your average political podcast. I am not somebody that is explicitly interested only in hardcore politics. I like culture. I like art. I like music. I like fitness. I like entrepreneurship. Uh, You know, it, it is just me talking with my friends about what is going on in the world. And, and this is the way that I see the world and, and I see things with reality, but a sense of humor. So if you like what you're hearing, download Can't Cancel Rob Smith. Awesome, man. And Rob, where can people follow you on social media? They can follow me on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Rob Smith Online. Awesome. Rob Smith, thank you for coming on the Real Talk with Zuby show. All right, man. Thanks for having me.